recognize Ms. Dingell from Michigan for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Valensky, thank you for your service. And I hope in this committee we can keep from those kind of personal attacks. Uh, thank you for being here today and for the work that you've done to see America through the darkest days of COVID-19. We've heard a lot of misleading statements and accusations here today, and I want to set the record straight. Quite frankly, I'm tired of having the same conversations and hearing the same accusations over and over and over again. So let's clear this up again. There was no special access or collusion between the teachers union and the CDC to keep schools closed. And my colleagues on the other side are grossly mischaracterizing the situation. So let's go after the facts again. It is routine practice, and I believe common sense for the CDC or any group, I do it, to consult impacted groups on guidance that affects them. Dr. Valensky, in a shortly, in a short, can you tell us more about why it's important for the CDC to engage with stakeholders on guidance that impacts them? It was critically important to get the, the schools open. And in order to do so, we needed to make sure that the day that we released our guidance, it would be implementable on the ground. So we spoke to all the numerous stakeholders, over 50, to make sure that our guidance would be implementable on the ground. It would have been irresponsible not to. So I also understand that when <coughs> developing guidance to reopen all schools and help all schools stay open, the CDC engaged a wide range of organizations with various expertise. In fact, last week, HHS provided the select committee with a list of the organizations CDC engaged with in its developing the school reopening guidance. And it includes organizations like the American Academy of Pediatrics, the National Governors Association, the more Republicans there than Dems, for the record, the American College Health Association, the Association of Public Health Laboratories, Autism Speaks, and the National Parent Teacher Association, just to name a few. More than 50, and they're part of the record. Each of these organizations brought their perspective and expertise to conversations on how we get our schools safely and responsibly opened. And each of these organizations provided reasonable feedback to CDC guidance, like accommodating immunocompromised teachers when returning to in-person learning or suggesting that if a new variant were to emerge and cause high community transmission, the guidelines would need to be revisited to keep schools open, not close them. These organizations recognized that the CDC shared their goals to safely reopen the schools. So while my colleagues on the other side so carelessly throw around outrageous accusations about collusion between teacher unions and CDC, I want to make it clear that the routine practical way that CDC went about developing school reopening policies was common sense. I want to make sure we're giving the American people the full picture, that at a time the American death toll from COVID-19 had just surpassed 400,000, and that the first vaccines had only just been authorized for emergency use a few weeks prior to this guidance, and that only 46% of US schools had reopened for full-time in-person learning when you came on board. I want us to be clear that CDC's guidance helped get kids safely back in the classroom, along with the American Rescues Plan vaccine program. We were able to get more than 95% of schools reopened for full-time in-person learning one year later. Now, let's set the record straight on vaccines. We know vaccines are the safest and most effective public health measure that reduces hospitalizations and protects against severe disease or death from COVID-19. According to a Commonwealth Fund study published in December 2022, COVID-19 vaccines had already prevented 3.2 million deaths and 18.5 million additional hospitalizations. However, in early 2021, our nation didn't have the infrastructure to swiftly administer vaccines. Director Valensky, can you tell us more about the CDC's efforts to support a safe and equitable vaccine distribution? 
Yes, thank you for that. We, as you know, did not have a vaccine infrastructure for vaccines for adults. It is something that we are asking for, for Congress um, to, to establish that so we don't have to recreate one again. What I will say is that we worked tirelessly with our federal retail pharmacy partners, with federal qualified health care centers, with community and faith-based organizations, with, um, uh, with our state and local health departments, um, across, the, across the country with all sorts of partners so that we could get vaccines and we we needed to bring vaccines where they were. We did mass vaccination sites. We did small vaccination sites. We did vans. It was really um, an all-intensive effort, but we need that infrastructure. Um, that was stood up for COVID, and it is no longer, you know, we will continue what we can for COVID with the resources that we have, but we do not have a large-scale vaccine infrastructure for adults. Thank you. At this point, I want to also talk to my Republican friends about there's probably nobody with more vaccine hesitancy in this committee than me. I got Gayon's beret from a flu shot in my 20s. And does that mean nobody should ever have a flu shot again? I was scared to death to get this COVID-19 vaccine. I think I even shared it with you at the time. I didn't trust doctors around here, to be perfectly frank. I went to the University of Michigan and talked to the infectious disease doctors. And they encouraged me that this was the right thing to do. It was a different chemistry. But I remain seriously concerned about Americans getting the wrong information, from misinformation about the disease and how it spreads, vaccines and even treatments. Quite frankly, I have a very close, I won't tell you who the family member is because I might not be here if I did, but um, he supports President Trump. He took hydrochloroquine and almost died, was in the hospital for weeks, and I they believe what they hear. So we need to make sure, and we know sometimes people are giving information that's the best information that they have at the time. But unfortunately, the world is experiencing the largest global decline in decades in the number of children receiving basic immunizations. And we are seeing a resurgence in previously controlled diseases like polio and measles. Dr. Valensky, how is vaccine misinformation affecting children's health? I think that you nailed it spot on. We, for the first time last year, saw our first um, paralytic polio case in this country in about 10 years. Um, we have seen numerous outbreaks of measles. In my inbox, I, you know, not infrequently will get an email saying there's a new measles case um, that has been uh, detected in the United States. It is critically important. We have seen a downturn in our uh, number of incoming kindergartners who are vaccinated for all the um, ACIP recommended vaccines. And it is critically important that we maintain um, vaccine uh, you know, full vaccination for the health and safety of our children. Thank you. Is there anything you want to add as we I close? Um, thank you for your support. Um, I will say that the it is critically important to get COVID-19 vaccine today and, you know, for the fall, whatever we may see in the fall, also the flu vaccine for those who can tolerate it. Um, but vaccines have, have been a public health staple that have been critically important for, for decades. Um, we are actually, I think, uh, have a, our victims of our own successes. We are so blessed that we are not seeing these illnesses in our children because we have had vaccines for so many decades. Once we start seeing those resurgence, that's going to be uh, really detrimental to our children. Thank you for your service, and I yield back. Thank you.